Welcome. Welcome to the launch of Philanthropic Responses to Disasters. I'm Susan Phillips, professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. Given that we're hosted by Carleton, I'd like to acknowledge that the university is located on the campus. Its campus is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. As settlers, immigrants, descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many Indigenous peoples of our locales and hope for a more just future together. I'm going to turn it over to our lead uh, editor and colleague, Alex Sandra Williamson, who is uh, having a very early morning in Brisbane. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Susan. And I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I live and work here in Brisbane, the Turrbal and the Yagara people. And I pay my respects to their elders and recognize that these lands um, have always been places of teaching, of research and learning. And it is such a pleasure to have so many people, some old friends and some new, here to celebrate with us the publication of our edited book on philanthropic response to disasters. Thank you all for joining us in spite of the difficulties of time zones and busy schedules. Please feel free, of course, to grab a beverage appropriate to your time zone or indeed inappropriate to your time zone um, and enjoy, sit back and enjoy the next 45 minutes or so of discussion. So looking back, the book had its genesis at Queensland University of Technology um, here in Brisbane, where I work as a senior research fellow. As the Australian bushfire summer of 2019-2020 prompted many conversations around how philanthropic individuals, organisations, institutions and collaborations could better respond when disasters occurred. We were thinking about what distinguished disaster philanthropy from philanthropy at other times and for other causes and thinking about what had changed over the decades and what had we learned to do it better. So Diana, Susan and myself and some other colleagues recognised the need for a book, a collection of chapters that would draw together different elements of expertise and knowledge that could serve as a frame for our understanding of disaster philanthropy. Of course, in early 2020, the COVID pandemic was just about to emerge and it both delayed the book and yet made it more urgent. So as stated in the preface, the book begins with an examination and a critical reflection on those two key concepts, disaster and philanthropy looking at the different ways that these are and have been understood. And the following chapters go on to explore the mitigation and preparedness for disasters, as well as relief and then recovery once disaster strikes. Questions, ambiguities and paradoxes around disaster fundraising, regulatory and policy issues, stakeholders and approaches are all examined. The chapter authors, draw on lessons across time and geographies and provide a platform for strengthening and developing the field of disaster philanthropy. So in just a moment, I will introduce some of those chapter authors who will each speak for five minutes or so, reflecting on their chapters and on the field of disaster philanthropy as a whole. But first there are some important people who I would like to briefly thank. Professor Tobias Jung of the University of St Andrews in Edinburgh is the lead editor of the book series, Global Perspective. Uh, Susan and I express our gratitude for his encouragement and support for the book from inception to publication. We are honoured that our book, Philanthropic Response to Disasters, is the first volume in the series and, of course, look forward to reading those that will follow. And on a personal note, I would like to thank Diana and Susan for their mentoring of me 
in my first role as a book editor. Despite some twists and turns in the pathway to publication, I've really valued and enjoyed your company along the way. I also thank our chapter authors for their contributions and for their commitment to the book through the turbulent years of the pandemic and the challenges it posed to all. To Megan Conway, Kristen Pugh and Susan Phillips, our Canadian contingent, to Jeff Schlegelmilch and Greg Witkowski from the US, to Diana Leet from the UK, and last but not least, to the Australian crew, Wendy Scaife, Miles McGregor-Lowndes, Christian Siebert, Michael Moran, and Graham Dwyer. You all shared your expertise, met writing and editing deadlines, accepted feedback graciously, and were patient with the inevitable delays. And it has been a privilege to work with you all. So now we come to some reflections from our chapter authors, and I will invite them to speak in the same order in which they appear in the book itself. So Diana, then Miles, then Susan and Greg. And following their contributions, we have ample time for discussion, comments and questions. So what I propose is that we first listen to all four chapter authors, and then at the end, we can address specific questions to each during our Q&A. And I would encourage you to pose those questions via the Q&A function in the webinar um, as the speakers are um, sharing their thoughts with us. Um, but I will introduce all four of our speakers now and then ask them to take the virtual floor. So Diana Lee is the author of 100, over 120, 121 now, articles and books on the nonprofit sector and social policy, with a particular interest in philanthropic foundations. She's held research positions in universities and think tanks in the UK, the US and Australia. She's the author of the chapter in our book on the history of philanthropic responses to disasters, as well as co-author of the chapter on philanthropic foundations. Miles McGregor Lowndes is Professor Emeritus and Founding Director of the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies at Queensland University of Technology. He co authors the valuable series of legal case notes of charity law across jurisdictions and has a keen inter interest in the intersection between emerging technologies and nonprofit organisations. Miles' chapter considers the legal and regulatory tangles that often arise in the collection and distribution of disaster funds. Susan Phillips leads the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership Program at Carleton University in Ottawa, who are our online hosts today, and thank you. She served for many years as Editor-in-Chief of the journal Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Quarterly, and her research focuses on public policy, for charities and philanthropy, as well as place-based giving. Susan's chapter in our book with co-author Kristen Pugh examines the role of public policy instruments in disaster philanthropy. And the final of our authors is Greg Witkowski. He's a senior lecturer in nonprofit management at Columbia University in New York and affiliate faculty with the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. As well as a chapter author in our book, he has a forthcoming publication as a sole author to watch out for, also in the disaster philanthropy field. Greg's chapter here in our book provides a new perspective on the 9-11 terrorist attacks, drawing on primary sources to explore how philanthropy interacted with service provision to coordinate and collaborate in the longer term. Now, I have absolutely failed to do each author justice in these very abbreviated introductions, but I hope what I may have done is encouraged you all to look them up and learn more about and from their research. So Diana, if I can hand the floor to you to take us through the history perhaps of disaster philanthropy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. And at the risk of making this sound like sort of love in, um, I'd like to thank you and Susan <laughs> and the other authors for, for everything I mean it, it was not the best well it was the perfect time to be writing a book on disaster philanthropy but in other ways it was so not the perfect time so 
the book was conceived uh, before, as Alex said, before the pandemic, and then executed during that time, which made for certain difficulties. But I'm just, yeah, very grateful to everybody that we we made it. Um, and on the subject of disaster timing, I should apologize for my, my sunglasses. Uh, I have been waiting for cataract surgery for, well, actually a year because of the delays post COVID, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, um, as luck would have it, I had it yesterday. So yeah, so apologies for that. Um, I really, really enjoyed writing the, the, the history chapter. It, it is only a start on the, on the topic, obviously, because it's huge. But I think one of the things that, that struck me most was actually how little has changed. Um, we, the Australian bushfires narrative was, was just so familiar. Uh, the amazing scope and scale of international giving, the role of the media, the celebrity fundraising, the, the sort of pocket money democratization of giving alongside the sort of eye-watering gifts of the rich and famous, the truckloads of donated goods, um, followed by the appeals to stop giving stuff. Um, and then came the stories about too much bureaucracy while people were, uh, were, were still receiving nothing. Um, the, and then, then, of course, there was the, there were the too few checks leading to fraud. And then alongside those themes were the, were the, um, the mountains of money unspent uh, and the, the outrageous uh, administration costs of charities. Uh, and and, the, and then running through all that was the the story about what donors really intended and whether the money was actually being spent on what they wanted. And as I began to look back through through the history of responses to uh, philanthropic responses to disaster, those were just those themes have always been there. Um, whether you're talking about the, the Scottish famine response in the 1830s, the Chicago fire, the, you just go on. And, and it's, the say, it's basically the same sequence um, all the way through. So what's changed? Well, uh, I think one of the things that interested me most was the way in which our notions of what this is for has changed. So in the, in the 19th century, it was about uh, relieving financial suffering. And if you didn't, if you weren't, if you weren't financially suffering, then you didn't really qualify. Uh, and in the uh, Edinburgh fire of, of the 1830s and so on, and in, similarly in the US, um, the, the, the wealthy didn't qualify. And, and then that sort of starts to change. And um, you begin to find a sort of slight concern that, oh, well, maybe we need to, uh, we need to seek out people of refinement who would, be, uh, would have to be helped discreetly uh, because they would be too proud to ask for help. And then by the time you get to the 1912 Titanic disaster, then uh, it's, it's about um, you need to help in accordance with wider welfare practices and scientific assessment. And then you get to, and then there's a sort of change where instead of it being about relieving financial need and suffering, it's about distribution is about the relief of loss or harm. Um, so if, in the UK, one of the seminal moments was the Avavan disaster in, in 1966, when the Charity Commission actually recognised that, that um, on the unprecedented emotional state 
of the community was was a form of need. And then and then the We Love Manchester Emergency Fund after the Manchester bombings takes that to another level where they actually uh, make payments for uh, psychological injury. And that, that psychological injury theme is, is, uh, is quite difficult. And then I think there's a, another phase where you, you get away from the sort of morality and moralizing and um, it's about, it doesn't disappear, but it just takes a different form. Um, and you start to talk about uh, uh, distribution as a, as a recognition of, as a recognition of loss. And I think children are a very interesting example here because in the early phases, children are not, children's funeral expenses are regarded as a as a cost but otherwise children are not a cost or a need or anything that needs to be recognized um today children paradoxically have a financial value um and are recognized in in distribution so sorry i realize i'm running out of time but um I think that that theme of how our notions of what this is all about changes and we've moved from a, a compensation, which is not a word we would use now and would deliberately mostly avoid, compensation for need to a, a recognition of loss. And it's much more, I think, a, a sort of cultural statement about I'm with you. I see your loss. It's not about how much money you've got. Um, and and Miles may well want to um, disagree or uh, expand on that, because I think, although we, we didn't discuss the examples we were going to use, I think Miles' chapter very much um, takes up some of those, some of those themes. So that's by reflection, Alex. Thank you, Diana and Miles, if you would like to follow on from that beautiful segue. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, uh, thank you, Diana, for that great introduction. And uh, I too would like to pay my respects to uh, Alex uh, for doing it because at the beginning, uh, somebody had suggested that I ought to take that role and uh, I was ex supremely successful in wiggling out of that. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, my, uh, my chapter dealt with the legal ta tangles uh, that often arise in the collection and distribution of disaster funds. And uh, uh, Diana and I, when a big disaster occurs, often uh, tag each other with what's going to happen next in the press. And it must be about time for the press to do a expose or a, or a member of parliament or, or local official to grumble about um, funds not being distributed enough and then comes administration costs. It's, it's entirely predictable and usually follows uh, a set pattern. But anyway, my interest is in uh, the legal tangles and what uh, usually arises is fraud. Um, and this is just of the nature of the beast. Um, but fraud is usually fairly well um, dealt with by the law formal uh, and the indirect law uh, through the police and other other regulators, uh, if you can find it. Uh, clearly, the internet platforms and fundraising uh, uh, on the internet has uh, made uh, detection and prosecution of fraud a little more difficult, though. The other difficulties uh, that arise are confusion about who the beneficiaries are, uh, who was contemplated at the time if they were, uh, or if they weren't, who they should be, uh, or the benef that beneficiaries don't meet the legal test mm -hmm. in anglophile jurisdictions of being charitable uh, enough. Um, and I'll discuss that in a moment. And then there are problems created when the amount is too small 
uh, and you can't do anything with it. But more more likely than not, and the usually interesting problems uh, for lawyers and others are when the intended amount uh, is uh, too large for the intended purposes. Uh, and this has been growing with a steroid-like rate uh, when uh, the internet uh, and funding platforms get into the uh, act. And then there are the divisions in the community, uh, usually local community, about how the funds are to be distributed, particularly when there's uh, too much, uh, too much uh, funds for the intended purpose. And uh, more often than not, I've noticed that uh, local government officials or parliamentarians uh, suddenly decide that uh, there's a good public infrastructure program to fund from the surpluses. Uh, and that happens unless the courts uh, get involved. Um, the underlying challenge is the potential conflict between charity law and the expectations of donors and infected and affected uh, communities. And uh, one of the uh, judges in the earliest uh, case that I deal with uh, said at, right at the beginning of the case, the result is shown that a motion is a bad foundation for such an act fundraising activity. And I think he was uh, probably, uh, probably correct. Um, charity law principles are based on restricted purposes uh, that generally require a poverty filter, as Diana has indicated, uh, and things have moved on from then, and the presence of a broad class of beneficiaries rather than a specific group of people. Uh, and donors often want to assist the specific individual or groups, and they don't fit neatly into the box of charity. So to tease out these uh, themes, I had a look at two bus, bus crashes, which were 60 uh, years apart, one in England, uh, right at the beginning of uh, uh, motor vehicles and motor vehicle insurance, and it was that a bus on a foggy night uh, ran into the back of a column of marching cadets off to watch a boxing, uh, a boxing show and uh, tragically killed about 24, as well as uh, maiming and injuring uh, others. Uh, complete disaster. I think it's still about the second largest uh, road crash disaster uh, in the UK. Uh, and of course, there was a public appeal for that. And then the other one I compare it with was a Canadian case of the Humboldt hockey players, young adult uh, staff and, uh, and players uh, were tragically uh, run over uh, by a truck at an intersection uh, in a minibus. Uh, and I think about 16 uh, died in that as well as, and they're all from a, a, a really quite close knit uh, local uh, area as a hockey team. Um, and then I had a look at two natural disasters, which were some 50 years apart. They were two Australian because we do disasters pretty well. Uh, one was uh, Cyclone Tracy, which hit Darwin and uh, just decimated on uh, Christmas Eve, I think, decimated the whole town of Darwin. It was uh, it was uh, it was just uh, just a, just the pictures show everything just absolutely flattened. Uh, and then, of course, the Australian bushfires, uh, which had the large um, barber uh, social media uh, appeal, which would held the record for uh, fundraising on a on a internet platform. Uh, I think it's been overtaken recently. Um, so I I tease out the uh, the issues in uh, all of these uh, uh, things, um, and they are uh, pretty predictable. Um, but I think the standouts for me uh, are two things. One, crowdfunding appeals certainly have um, exacerbated uh, the issues. Um, and what was really interesting in this case was uh, that in the Humboldt Canadian case, uh, the, the Canadians uh, have a really good uniform law program. And some far-sighted uh, individuals had, in fact, proposed a uniform law for internet fundraising and disaster appeals. Um, and in fact, the province in which this occurred uh, was in fact the only province in Canada which had adopted uh, the legislation. 
And so it was a fascinating uh, test case to see how the legislation would go uh, in dealing. And largely it, it, it was good um, and dealt with the issues uh, and they're in the chapter, uh, but the uniform uh, law people came back and revised the code after that. And so Canada um, has a great template and I'm not sure how many other states uh, have adopted that, but it seems like a really good model uh, to me uh, for not only Canada, but for other places. Um, so that Uniform uh, Law Conference of Canada uh, was a very interesting uh, uh, spin to all of this. The other things is that um, uh, the bus crash in England, the Gillingham bus disaster, was right at the beginning of motor vehicle insurance. Uh, and for the first time, uh, the bus was in fact insured. In fact, the bus company admitted liability very early on. And so everybody got paid out fairly well um, by insurance. Uh, there was some limited government assistance and then they had this fund on top of that. So it's almost like you got compensated three times uh, over uh, by, the, uh, by the government, uh, which is now more and more stepping into this. And you can see that in the response to the natural natural disasters that we've seen, uh, insurance, uh, as well as uh, philanthropic funds, which can be quite significant, in fact, in dwarf uh, insurance and other payments. So you get triple, triple dipping. Um, and this doesn't seem to have been uh, regarded uh, as an issue, nor can I find that it's been anywhere uh, uh, dealt with in the, in the literature. And I think it's uh, an interesting uh, spin on whether this is um, compensation, whether it's bounty, um, or what role does it play, um, and what does this have as we get more and more disasters? Um, will insurance pull back? Uh, will government pull back? Or will philanthropy pull back? Um, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what combinations of these actors uh, will be involved uh, in disaster compensation um, and philanthropy uh, and gifting uh, in the in the future, but I suspect it will be a, a more of a significant issue. Well, let me um, uh, conclude there, but I found uh, writing the chapter was one of the more pleasurable um, tasks that I've um, done uh, yeah, recently. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed having a look at, uh, at the issue. Uh, so Alex, back to you. Thank you, Miles. And I think there are some really fascinating issues there, which, which we may return to in our Q&A discussion shortly. But for now, um, Susan, if I can ask you to speak to your chapter um, co-authored with Kristen. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> this is, uh, in, a, in a sense, the, uh, the companion chapter to, to Miles's work with uh, Dr. Christian Pugh, who was then a postdoctoral fellow with us at Carleton and now is a senior policy analyst with the Government of Canada. One of the challenges in thinking about policy is we're thinking about policy for philanthropy, for philanth philanthropic responses, uh, for which there is virtually no literature, uh, a, a, a dabble here and there, as opposed to the vast literature on policy for disaster management. And we also wanted to look at, to think about both the, in a sense, the getting side, the, the how to facilitate the, the giving and the and the the appropriateness of that, and on the distribution side, the the uh, the way in which policy has a role there. And we're very clear in the in the chapter that we don't see philanthropy as a substitute for government funding in disasters. It it's minuscule, well, it's big, but it's also minuscule compared to uh, the cost to government. Uh, but it does have some advantages uh, to donors who feel that sort of warm glow, that expression of, of, of grief. They may know local organizations so they can, they can deploy their do donations well. Uh, philanthropy can often uh, be raised quite quickly across borders and don't have to deal with the political uh, implications uh, of, of jurisdictions, but it also has important limits, not only in size, it's often uneven, it's influenced by media attention, which is picked up in other, uh, other chapters. And as we see uh, 
the increasing severity and frequency of disasters, particularly climate related. There's real questions about the sustainability and the role of policy and the sustainability of philanthropy. So our chapter takes a look, asks the basic question, well, what, what do tend to be the policy approaches? And there, there, there are two main ones. Uh, one is uh, top-up incentives uh, to, to giving top-up incentives in the form of increased uh, tax benefits, uh, tend to be used particularly in the US. And perhaps the most popular one is matched funding. So it creates a sense of you give, you give one, you get one free to the donor because government will, will match. That often, uh, as we, we found in surveying how, how match funding is used, it's inconsistent, it's used in, in some kinds of uh, disasters, often those that are getting more attention. Um, and it has the, the uh, potential downside of it often designates which organizations get the donations to qualify for, for the match funding. And that in itself uh, can create uh, challenges. Those are often the international intermediaries, the Red Cross, et cetera, uh, rather than local organizations. And there are some important ways in which public policy for philanthropy in uh, disaster contexts is limited or could do more of. One is informing donors, you know, what's actually needed, the value, as you will see, is, is repeated uh, through many chapters the value of giving money that's more flexible and fungible than giving of goods. Um, and informing donors about the longer term, almost all policy for philanthropy and indeed uh, philanthropy itself in this context is in the context of relief. It's focused on the immediate and uh, tends to, to decrease uh, significantly over time. There's a very rapid drop off. So the, the, the donations that and contributions and support that go to, to rebuilding, to mitigation and prevention and to long-term uh, resilience building in community is very limited. And we make the case that governments could do much more in, uh, in that kind of education role of, of this full spectrum of philanthropic uh, responses over time. We touch briefly on volunteers. The volume itself is mainly focused on, on um, financial giving, but in policy terms, volunteers are also important. They're almost always left to local governments or to the nonprofits that are managing volunteers themselves. Yet there are, are in the background uh, significant policy issues, liability, for example, uh, training, uh, the gendered nature of volunteerism. Certainly we've seen that in health pandemics and the overall decline in volunteerism, uh, which in most uh, high income countries is, is in decline and has been for several years. What does that mean for our future ability to uh, mobilize volunteers who are so needed? And finally, we address some of the, the regulatory issues that Miles takes up so well, but, but do that in a less detailed format. And I would strongly encourage you to, to read Miles's four cases, which are, are absolutely delightful. But again, the, the policy aspects of cross-border giving, in one sense, you want to facilitate cross-border giving. On the other hand, you want to make sure that it's not uh, ending up in, uh, in mischievous, nefarious ways for instance, supporting supporting terrorism, crowdfunding uh, again that that has the ability to mobilize quickly across borders, open to uh, to fraud and and uh, abuse in many ways. We draw on the example of uh, the truck convoy that. Uh, camped out in our city for uh, weeks and weeks in, uh, in, in January and February of, uh, of last year, in which the crowdfunding raised millions. Almost all of it came from outside the country. The policy issue of what happens when we raise too much, uh, which is actually probably even more uh, troublesome than when we raise uh, too little. And then as Miles noted, that the challenge for governments where you have multiple sources of of quote compensation, insurance, liability, 
government, direct government funding, as well as philanthropy. And in some, we'd say there's, there's a need for much greater attention to the policy responses to supporting philanthropy as a complement uh, to other actors, uh, other, other sources of Thank you, Susan. And um, I'm mindful of the time because our final chapter author, um, Greg Witkowski, has um, only a limited availability this morning. So without further ado, Greg, thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. And um, thank you, Diana and Susan, as well, for this um, invitation and uh, opportunity to contribute to the book as well. It's a uh, really, I think, an important um, milestone for the field. And, you know, I'll, I'll start with why, which is um, the general public misunderstands two essential things, uh, how nonprofits work and how long disasters impact people, right? And mm -hmm. so they're two fundamental things that we're, we're um, uh, talking about today and that your book um, begins to address. And so, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the, all the contributions and how they've gone about in a, in a really comprehensive way to, to uh, raise these, these issues. Um, my contribution looks at the September 11th um, uh, attacks and the response to them, and specifically looks at efforts to coordinate um, these responses. And, um, you know, there are two things I think relative to this that, that are uh, relevant for the contemporary period. Uh, one is um, the fact that the September 11th attacks were really um, seen as a national disaster. So very geographically focused, uh, but really kind of experienced as a national disaster in which people in other parts of the country would say we were attacked or we had this happen to us. Right. And and they would all through the power of television, you know, experienced it almost firsthand that day. Um, you know, almost live as it was happening because it was immediately on the news and the like. So there, there was this real very personal tie that people had to the event, which actually also means that while it's 22 years ago almost, uh, it's still very present in the United mm -hmm. States. And so has that also very different um, uh, feel for a disaster, uh, in part because of, I think, the attachment that people had, in part because of the national media coverage that continued months after. Um, the outpouring of support was much greater than any other previous disaster, which also began to affect how um, the response uh, came about. And so uh, about $2.8 billion was granted uh, after or donated after uh, the September 11th attacks to various um, nonprofits. Some of these were relief organizations like the American Red Cross. Uh, they alone collected about a billion dollars. And then others went to other um, organizations. And among these was the September 11th Fund, uh, which was a nonprofit created literally on the afternoon of September 11th between the New York Community Trust, which is our local community foundation here in New York, and the United Way of New York City. And so those two came together that afternoon. So there's going, recognizing there was going to be an outpouring of support uh, following the attacks. And before anyone really knew um, the extent of the attack, before anyone really knew uh, if there would be you know, follow-up attacks, uh, they created this fund. They created a website the next day. Money started pouring in. Um, there was a telethon that was held a little over a week later where you know, the who's who of, of um, music as well as uh, um, um, actors were there, I mean, to to, to uh, give one example, someone like Adam Sandler was answering the phones, wasn't even talking, right? <laughs> was just on the phones answering for pledges. Uh, so really was um, th this major event that attracted quite a bit of donations. And one of the key things I think for this fund was that it was established in a way that um, really recognized that they needed to have flexibility in how the money was spent. So one of the misconceptions about philanthropic giving is that nonprofits function simply as pass-throughs. I, as the donor, give money, it passes through this nonprofit, and we just give it to the victims, right? Um, and so what the September 11th fund, the way it was established, was with a much broader mission, which is to say they were going to say, uh, give, be able to give to anyone affected by this. So that meant, you know, they could define it more broadly. And as money began to roll in much higher than they initially anticipated, they began to see the opportunity then 
to give to others who are affected in New York, to give for long-term care, to begin to think about mental health needs, all these broader issues that come up after disasters that are usually ignored in part because there's not enough money for it and in part because there's not much popular understanding of the increase in those needs. And so um, for that reason, the September 11th attacks actually began to change the way that um, disaster relief was carried out because nonprofits got much more involved than they normally had been. They had the capacity to, and they kind of continued to engage in these uh, recovery efforts much later. And so one of the trends in our understanding surrounding disasters, and this was raised earlier, uh, what is that these actually have a longer term impact on individuals and that we're looking at years out before people recover. You know, it's really moving from infrastructure to individuals. When you begin to look at that, you can see, sure, you know, there's a new building where the Twin Towers once stood, um, but the effect on people is still there. And so um, when you think about that and how then nonprofits, what is their primary responsibility? Well, nonprofits are about people, right? And about engaging with human needs and human services. And especially in the United States, a lot of our human service delivery actually works through nonprofit organizations. And so it sort of fits well with um, what's involved there. One of the things that was also discovered though after uh, the September 11th fund was formed is that you did have all these players involved as others have referenced. And um, it became difficult for those who needed help to get that help. They had to go from one place to the next to the next essentially continue to relive their trauma, right? By telling the story of how they were impacted, by showing whatever information they had. Uh, and it, it made it a very difficult situation. One survivor referred to it as the bureaucracy of death that you had to go through and sort of prove that your husband died. And how many times do you have to show that and tell that? And so um, one of the things that nonprofits realized and did after this, under a bit of pressure from, uh, from politicians and from media, is they created a separate organization to actually be a one-stop shop for victims. And so this was called the 9-11 uh, United Services Group. And at least in my experience in the US, it's really the only time that an entirely separate and independent 501c3 nonprofit was created to provide this um, response and services to focus just on the needs of these individuals over the longer term and to allow then all the other service providers to kind of go back to functioning more normally, right? So this United Services Group, they would have meetings in which representatives uh, from the different service organizations could be there, could talk about the needs that they were seeing, could work with caseworkers who would oversee engagement with different uh, clients. Uh, but still, you know, that could be separated off a little bit from the fact that yes, you still had to provide services for the rest of the community, um, that was less impacted by uh, the disaster. And so, you know, to me, it, it's really a fascinating model and I thought was highly successful in this particular disaster. I've yet to see it replicated. And I think part of the reality is that most disasters don't have this level of um, outpouring of support. And so without that capacity to do so, it's more difficult to create an organization um, set up in that way. Nonetheless, I do think it's, it's a, a solid model of how to work collaboratively. And even if an organization is not formed explicitly after a disaster, the notion of creating a one-stop shop for individuals to go to and to, to um, figure out what all the services that are available, especially you know, as both Miles and Susan were uh, pointing to, they come from so many different sources and trying to negotiate that in the middle of the trauma of dealing with a disaster is such a struggle for individuals that that is among the best things that nonprofits can do is intercede and say, here's your list of what you have available of the services that are available. Let's help you get to those. And so I think the 9-11 um, uh, United Services Group really is a, a model for how disaster relief can better be carried out. And my sense is that it's something that we're going to need even more and more as we turn to the future. So, you know, the 9-11 disaster in many ways is, is a unique one. Um, but in other ways, we're seeing more and more devastating natural disasters uh, here in the U.S. Um, especially, I know, so just to take in the case of the U.S., I had some statistics that were kept from um, 1977 to 2001. 
there was an average of four one billion dollar disasters uh so those that created a billion dollar of damages or more uh in the u.s annually so you know over over that time period you could expect a certain number of these but it was enough spread out that the response could actually address them in uh 2021 alone there were 20 of these right so that you're you're really going from major disaster to major disaster to major disaster and finding the time to um both get enough air for fundraising, you know, which is one of the critical things, but then also to make sure that those service provision uh, service providers are engaged over a long enough period of time because we're looking at something that's so devastating in its impact uh, that clearly it's going to be a year long recovery spot or years long recovery process. And so um, I think those are some of the key takeaways and thinking about um, how the September 11th attacks themselves were uh, the response was carried out, but also as we consider how this may have an impact uh, looking forward. Greg, thank you so much. Um, I think, as you say, the 9-11 attacks had just some, some unique characteristics that um, still make them a fascinating case study and I know that you drew on some empirical data for that so it was a, a great contribution to the book and thank you. Now we do have a few minutes for some Q&A and I can see that there are indeed some questions which have been posed by um, some of our friends and colleagues who've joined us this morning. Um, so the first is from Jenna Ellis. Um, and she's asking anybody who cares to chip in on this one. Um, she, her question is around donors' intentions following a natural disaster. And she's saying that the results from her data say that the donors' expectations do not align with um, the purpose specified on an online fundraising platform. And that broadly speaking, donors do not understand where their money is going. So she's asking for advice to nonprofits on managing this more effectively when they as organizations have minimal control, and I would suggest very little, over online fundraisers. So they are highly effective, but there can be damage done to institutional trust. So Miles has your hand up, love it. <laughs> yes, this is, a, this is a major gripe for me. Um, the clear solution in my view uh, is for the regulators uh, to uh, impose upon the internet fundraising platforms that if they raise funds in the name of a non-profit, they should first get the consent uh, of the non-profit uh, to the fundraising uh, program. Uh, this has been echoed in a number of academic papers in the US. And in fact, I believe in California, um, there is a fundraising regulation which is being discussed recently. It may already be enforced uh, that such consent uh, has to be first, uh, first uh, obtained uh, before seeking funds from the public. Uh, this would have alleviated the the Barber bushfire issue and many other issues uh, that we face. So either it's going to be government regulation or the or a um, self-regulatory uh, mechanism by the uh, fundraising platforms between themselves uh, that they don't raise funds unless the charity has given approval. Alex, you're still on mute. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I was going to do that at some point in time. I need that. No, need another coffee. Um, the second question pertained to the need to educate funders, and I, I think this is an, an overarching theme that has arisen from the book and the chapters, is that um, we have the knowledge. We know, as Diana said, that that the issues and the challenges that arise are consistent. We can predict them coming. But funders don't pay attention until disasters actually take place. How can we shift that? How can we encourage philanthropy to make better use of the time in between disasters? 
I'll take take that one on. I think it's important to distinguish between individual donors and institutional donors in this mm -hmm. in this context, and that individual donors are tend to and are likely to stay focused on the immediate. Something something happens, media attention. You you you. It's in your your home every night on the on on the news, and and you respond. For institutional donors, foundations in particular, relatively few have had disaster uh, response uh, as part of their mandate. But in one sense, there's a there's a silver lining from from climate change and uh, and from the pandemic in terms of this, which is that they pulled back. Um, the curtain on the underlying structural and systemic issues. So we've we've come to see to and foundations have come to see and are acting on more directly those intersections of social, economic, uh, racial, and climate justice, and that takes you to it more directly into the sphere of of mitigation prevention in a targeted way on those communities that are more um likely to feel the effects of those. So while it may be a longer long longer term than we would like response, I see some positive movement there on the institutional side, but I think we'll always see that separation of the individual versus the institutional in terms of what they focus on. Thank you, Susan. And there was a there was a follow-up to that particular question, which was around um, the role of celebrity philanthropy and celebrity fundraising in the wake of disasters. Um, obviously, this was highlighted in the Barber case in the Australian context, but of, indeed echoed throughout history as well, Diana. And I, that was one of the things I enjoyed about your chapter was that we think celebrity philanthropy mm. is, is a relatively new phenomenon and, and it, it completely isn't. Um, how do celebrities though make offer informed guidance when they do start fundraising appeals? Um, Alex, could I come in there? Am I muted? No, good. Um, yes, I, I, I mean, I think this is taking up Susan's theme too, that, that maybe we just need to accept that the general public will, for the moment anyway, be much more focused on relief. And I think that that leaves a, a wonderful opening for foundations who, on the whole, they don't have to, they're not under the same pressure to respond to the relief narrative. They can actually um, take their time and uh, think about prevention and resilience and recovery and so on. And I'm not sure where celebrities fit in that. Maybe they will inevitably be more inclined to the relief end of the spectrum, but perhaps we could do more with that particular group to uh, make them aware of of the real of the longer term needs. Sorry, that's not very articulate, but and and, and actually, this is something that I think, uh, Alex, in your chapter, in our chapter, we do we do touch on that. So we sort of cover it a bit. So, Diane, I think you have very neatly. Um anticipated and, and in some part addressed the final question that we have time for indeed um which is around that question of how how we go about trying to better direct philanthropic funds to the work of recovery and resilience and and i think this is this is a common theme in the questions that um you know we have the knowledge but how do we use instruments, policy, celebrity? How do we bring those factors together around what is perhaps the tougher work um, and the less visible and less heroic work um, of the, the longer term resilience and recovery? 
I wonder there whether whether the my impression is, but I don't really have enough knowledge to be uh, very definitive or authoritative on this. But I have the feeling that actually some of the New Zealand um, earthquake appeals actually did seem to get closer to that. This is not. This is not. There is a short term fix clearly, but actually. There is a much longer term issue here. And yeah, I wonder whether the, there are some, whether it depends in part on the nature of the, the disaster. So an earthquake more obviously requires a longer term plan. Um, you could argue that the disaster in Ukraine <laughs> requires a longer term plan. So maybe, Maybe those are issues that we can build on. I mean, Greg, would you would you say that there was a, a sense of a longer term need in the in the nine eleven case? Yeah, I think you know. I think part of it, as I said, is uh, you know they had the capacity, and so um, mm. you know that really allowed for uh, thinking more broadly. Uh, but certainly part of it was that it, you know, it was experienced nonprofit professionals who were making these decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, going back to the celebrity issue, that's one of those uh, key distinctions. So, you know, we see celebrities who uh, create their own nonprofits. Um, Sean Penn, Brad Pitt are two kind of famous examples related to, uh, in the Brad Pitt case related to uh, after Katrina in New Orleans and built a number of houses, all of which were, uh, you know, poorly built and really un, unsuitable for the area. Um, Sean Penn uh, sort of engaged in recovery in many places, but uh, there's some questions about how much money is actually being distributed, you know, and, and part of the problem there is celebrities are great at getting media attention. Uh, and so in that sense, they're really, um, you know, they have those skills that can kind of take over the narrative. Uh, but and we've also seen, you know, that that telethon that I mentioned collected at 150 million dollars in in one evening, right? So if if nonprofits, established nonprofits, can harness that celebrity and use it in collaboration, if there's some, uh, you know, there's enough identity with that organization that celebrities want to be affiliated with it and want to be part of an effort and relief in that way. Uh, then really the knowledge and the sort of media savvy of the celebrities is being put to use for the nonprofit professionals. Uh, but when it's, you know, uh, non nonprofits being founded by celebrities and then run, you know, essentially by them, then um, I think there are more struggles in, in the disaster um, uh, relief phase. And so mm -hmm. that, that's been, I think, one, one key distinction there. Um, yeah, thank you, Greg. And I'm I'm very conscious of the clock ticking, and I'm I'm keen to ensure that everybody gets to their next cup of coffee or their next meeting or a glass of wine or whatever it may be on time. So I am going to bring the discussion to a close there. I think there are some fascinating themes coming out around um, the ratio and the balance from of funding sources about who is eligible. Um, the the eternal question of who is eligible for funding. Um, and an underlying theme I think is fascinating around the time and the timing, both through history and, and in um, the, the phases of disasters and the phases and the capacities of funders of different kinds to respond um, in different timeframes. So what we do hope with this book is that some of these, these issues and questions will serve um, as, as a platform and as an invitation um, for future research and informed practice um, around the philanthropic dimensions of disaster response and bringing in diverse cultural and geographic and political contexts. So to bring our, our online launch to a close, um, there are, are just a few requests. One is that if um, you hear stories about how the book is being used to inform or promote better philanthropy practice or education, we would love to hear about those stories. Please reach out and share them by email or on social media. Um, I do encourage you, these affairs launches always end with a request, but mine specifically is that if there is an institutional library you are affiliated with that you submit a purchase request, um, many students, early career researchers and indeed community borrowers from libraries 
have less access to newly published books. And much as I love to hold a copy in my hands of a book, it is still very helpful for people to be able to access particular chapters. Thank you, Miles, um, in an ebook format. So I do encourage you, if you have the ability to put in a purchase request to a library, please do so. Um, if you're interested in writing a review about the book for a particular journal or publication, I do understand that there are a limited number of copies, review copies available from the publishers, so please reach out as well. So to our authors and contributors on this call in particular, but indeed to everyone, we extend our thanks for joining us early in the morning, late at night, or somewhere in the middle um, for the online launch of a book and I do encourage you to find a few hours to enjoy what I am very proud to say is a very readable volume. And thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Thanks to you, Thanks Alex, everyone. for your leadership.